especially on the first day, we talked about what friends believe. Testimonies are how friends act, um, how friends take that belief and bring it into the world. So the phrase Quaker testimonies um, is, is, is uttered often um, in, in, in meetings and gatherings of, of Quakers. Um, and it is often used more or less synonymously with what are known as the Quaker spices. And what spices stand for is simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. And I'm not going to go into great detail about these. Um, there's a great deal written about them if, if you do a uh, you know, Google search on Quaker spices, um, you will find a great deal of information. Um, so kind of the, the, the one sentence word, at least for me, um, simplicity means eliminating everything from our life that gets in between us and the spirit eliminating the distractions as best we can. Um, peace, peace means not doing harm. George Fox uh, was once being recruited to join the Puritan army, the new model army, <clears throat> and he declined. And he said, I seek to live in that life and power that taketh away the occasion for all war. So it's not just not fighting. Um, it's not, it's, it's more than simply non-participation in violence. It is trying to remove the occasion, remove the cause for all war. Um, integrity, uh, means speaking the truth as best we understand it at all times. Um, in fact, very early friends were known as friends of the truth um, before they, they became the Religious Society of Friends. Community is something we've talked about a lot so far. Um, it is the, the worship, the experience of the divine together um, in community. Equality, again, comes from the belief that there is that of God in everyone. And if we're all carrying a piece of the divine, then we are all equally God's children and uh, need to treat one another that way. Um, so, you know, one of, one of the examples of that is that early friends were one of the very first, if not the, if not the first, um, significant institution in England, um, to give women exactly the same rights and privileges and responsibilities as men. Um, so there were many women ministers among early friends. And finally, stewardship. This is actually a more recent addition to this list um, and includes care for the planet as a whole and being good caretakers of, of the bounty that has been given to us. So kind of reading through this list, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship, these are you know, these are really good values. <laughs> these, these, these are affirmative, uh, life-affirming life values. Um, but I actually have real concerns about the spices um, because I think they are beginning 
to become a Quaker creed. And rather than being descriptive, this is how, these are, these are corporate testimonies. These are ways in which groups of friends act. Um, they are becoming prescriptive, that if you're a Quaker, you need to believe in these. If you are a Quaker, you need to do this. And I'm not going to repeat the diatribe I did on the first day on, on the danger of creeds, um, but just remind you that kind of deep in, deeply embedded in Quaker history, deeply embedded in Quaker faith is a rejection of creeds because they come between us and the spirit, they interfere with revelation. And so I think it's important when we talk about spices, which like I say, are really good values, that we not see them as normative, that we not see them as rules, as laws that, um, that we are mandated to follow if we are to be Quakers. Um, there is a quote, and this may be one of the most cited quotations among liberal friends. It comes from a letter written in the mid, I think it was about 1660 something, um, by a gathering of elders at a village named Balby. It's known as the Epistle from the, uh, from the Elders of Balby. And it lays out kind of a rule, most, a set of rules, mostly scripture-based as to how friends should comport themselves. And then there is this postscript. And this postscript says, <coughs> Dearly beloved friends, these things we do not lay upon you as a rule, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. What they were trying to say was that, yes, the 20 odd rules that they'd laid out, and they were things like um, take care of the poor, um, honor, honor your parents, take good care of your children, um, fairly basic stuff. Um, they're saying, well, yeah, you know, we mean what we said, but anything that we said must be interpreted through the spirit. And it is revelation that matters, not the words we put down on this page. I think that holds true equally for, for testimonies. Um, I mean, in fact, the word, the concept testimony is pretty recent in Quaker history. Um, going back to the very early days, testimony was used pretty much in its, in its literal sense, which is um, kind of formal speech, either written or, or verbal, about a topic of importance, um, especially in kind of in a legal context. So there, there is testimony in, in a court of law. Um, and George Fox and Robert Barclay and John Woolman all use testimony in, in exactly that, um, that sense. William Penn did talk about nine testimonies that were particular to Quakers. Um, and he listed, among other things, uh, refusal to pay tithes, refusal to swear oaths, refusal to observe holy days, opposition to war among Christians, um, plainness of dress and of speech, um, and there were a couple of others that he didn't mention, but were also considered testimonies at the time. Um, refusal or, or non-participation non in hat honor and the refusal to use uh, titles and to address people as the um, instead of you. Um, many of these are actually related to um, integrity to speaking truth at all times. Um, so friends' refusal to swear oaths came from the fact that friends believed that we were mandated to speak truth at all time and swearing an oath implied that at other times we were free to, uh, to fudge, to lie. And so they were offended by this. Um, 
that uh, hat honor is when a, uh, a person of lower social status met a person of higher social status, um, you doffed your hat. And friends did not recognize differences in social status, so they refused to do so. Um, the same with the thou as opposed to you. Um, in the 1600s, English um, had different forms of uh, second person singular. One was formal and one was uh, informal. So you would use thee and thou to your family, to your close friends, and you would use the word you to a social superior. And uh, friends called everybody thee and thou because they did not, again, recognize those, those social distinctions. And this was one of the reasons why early friends spent so much time in prison, is for violating exactly these social codes, which were taken extremely seriously in those days. But if you think about it, a testimony that says we refuse to swear oaths or um, we will dress in plain clothes is really different from a, th these are very concrete and they are very uh, action oriented. These are things people do. And they're, that, that's very different from something like equality, which is a much broader, much vaguer uh, conceptual concept that in, and the, the word itself doesn't really imply an action. It's more an approach. It's, it's more a, a, a philosophical or a moral um, position. And so really for the first two, 200, 250 years um, of, of the Religious Society of Friends, um, the word testimony when it was used was very concrete. Um, it wasn't until the 1940s that a man named Howard Brinton um, was writing about Quakerism. He was trying to explain Quakerism to newly convinced friends, friends who had um, converted to, to uh, Quakerism. And he kind of grouped the historical actions of friends into what he called the social testimonies. Um, and he came up with four, which were community, harmony, equality, and simplicity. And that's really the origin of the spices. It's the origin of testimony as we think of it now. Um, so this was in 1943. It was not until the, the 1970s that the word and kind of the concepts and, and the whole notion of spices started appearing in um, faith and practice statements. Um, so, so this is really only about 50 years old. Um, but if, if there is, if as I argue, spices are great, but they're not actually testimonies and they're somewhat dangerous if we treat them wrong, then what would a real testimony be, kind of in my view? We have seen this before on the first day. Um, this is part of the, uh, quote from George Fox that also includes the uh, walking cheerfully over the world. But Fox says, let your lives be patterns, examples. Let your lives preach. And that I think is actually the core of what testifying means. Um, testimonies, like I said, testimonies are the way that friends act in the world. Um, testimonies are the social expression of individual or communal revelation. Um, testimonies are our faith made concrete in the world. Now we can testify as individuals and if our lives preach, that's, that's what we do always or frequently, or as often as we can. Um, testimonies can also be corporate, collective um, leadings. And I think 
that's kind of what, what Howard Brinton was going at when he first tried to identify groups of things. Are, are there ways that groups of friends have repeatedly acted over periods of time? And I think that's, that's, what he was, that's, that's really what the spices are trying to, to describe. Um, in my view, testimonies are stories about people. And testimonies are stories about our people, and thus testimonies are our stories. Um, now, I, I used exactly the same words yesterday when I was talking about history. Um, because in my mind, history and testimonies, if they're not exactly the same thing, they are incredibly tightly linked. Um, both in the sense of history as being something that we can learn from that happened in the past, but also in the sense that history is an ongoing narrative of which we are still part and that our lives form a piece of the story that has been going on for a long time, that is going on now, and that will continue to go on after, after we're no longer actors. So 100 years ago, um, Baltimore Yearly Meeting, the Book of Discipline, that they, that's what they used to call faith and practice statements. Um, it was also actually in the 70s um, that Yearly Meeting stopped using uh, the Book of Discipline as a title and started using faith and practice. But in 1927, Baltimore Yearly Meeting Book of Discipline said, the fundamental faith of the Religious Society of Friends leads to a way of life. In the application of the principles of truth to daily life, we acknowledge as supreme the authority of the divine spirit in the individual soul. No outward authority can replace it. Each individual must be true to his own understanding of his duty. And I think that kind of encapsulates the way I think about testimonies. It is being true to the voice of God as we best understand it and taking it into our lives. Friends in the past and now often hear the spirit directing them in, in, in some way. Um, and we know these as leadings. Leadings is when, when you hear the divine saying, Michael, this is the path forward. This is the way for you. So an inspired leading is a gift of grace and demands obedience. By living in a close and trusted community, we are given the support and the means to test that leading in conversation, in worship, or in a clearness community. Trust in the love of a listening community, commitment to the process of sharing our convictions, enables and enlivens us to move forward with the leading we have been given. So, you know, what, what does it mean to be a faithful friend? Um, it means doing the will of God. It means being obedient to the leadings of the Spirit. It means doing our best to live a life in harmony with the Divine Spirit. And there's some steps we take um, in this process. The first is listening. The second is hearing. The third is understanding. And the fourth is acting. And this is what I think of as the discernment process that, that Jade will be talking about again more tomorrow. But it's the acting, it's that last step, which is testimony. Um, and so the question to each of us individually and communally is, is what did I hear, what does it mean, and what should I do? And how do I know <clears throat> that what I that what I heard, what I think I heard, what I think I understood, and how I acted was right. 
we don't have creeds. We don't have written authoritative material that we can fall back and, upon and say, okay, yeah, number seven, I'm good. Um, and we make mistakes. And some of the sources of, of making mistakes could be faulty reasoning. It could be inaccurate or incomplete information. Um, it could be ego. Um, it is very tempting to believe that what we want to do is what the spirit wants us to do. And finally, it could be mental illness. And there have been examples of this throughout you know, the history of the Society of Friends. When you think about it, a culture that depends on revelation can be very dangerous if there are no controls on it, because what an individual claims was revealed to them may in fact be harmful, harmful to them, harmful to others. Um, and so very early on, the Religious Society of Friends, after some, some examples of friends who were convinced that they had received divine word, acted in ways that were dangerous and harmful, sometimes for them, sometimes for others, often for the Society of Friends. Um, the Religious Society of Friends came up with this notion of clearness and testing one's leading. And the idea here is to gather with other friends, your peers, your, 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 your companions in the spirit, and have them help you take apart what you think your leading is, understand it, and discern whether it is truly spirit-led and how you could best express that in your life. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of the synthesis of the individual and the communal. Um, that an individual leading is something that comes to me, but before I act on it, my responsibility to my monthly meeting is that I check with the meeting and, and say, I'm wrestling with something, or I, I believe I have a leading. Can you help me? Can you help me find clearness? And one of, one of the duties of a monthly meeting is to be able to provide clearness committees to its members. Um, there are some things that in kind of contemporary liberal friends require clearness committees. Um, membership is one of those, marriage is another. Um, but then there are many other things and it could range from changing jobs to becoming a traveling minister to taking on um, a social service project, et cetera. And, and, and that's kind of the clearness part. And to me, it is actually one of the miraculous things about my monthly meeting, and clearly all, all monthly meetings, is that a group of well-meaning amateurs can truly help one another through life's difficult decisions by drawing on our collective experience of the divine, worshiping together, praying together, talking in deep, meaningful ways together, and collectively, communally, help each other move forward in harmony with divine guidance. So I thought at one time, I thought to myself, so what are my testimonies? And 
the first time I thought that, I had that thought, and the second time I had that thought, and even actually today when I have that thought, I think, what a presumptuous question to ask. You know, who am I to think that I have testimonies? That, that seems so big. Um, so I end up reframing that question somewhat. And I now ask myself, how do I testify? Because somehow that seems smaller. It seems more human sized. It seems like something I could contemplate that I, I can testify. How do I try and bring my spiritual understanding, um, the revelation I get in meeting, um, into my life in a way that um, is not purely internal, but external as well? And Jade and I are on our monthly meetings, continuing Quaker Education Committee. I think it was last year, it was last year or the year before, the committee decided we would ask friends from the meeting to speak about parts of their life and how their faith informed the decisions they made, the actions they took, um, and uh, the aspirations that they had. But when we did this asking friends to talk about their lives, we called it Let Your Life, Letting Our Lives Speak. That was the name of that year's theme. The meeting house was packed to the rafters every first Sunday after worship. And to me, that experience was testifying in its purest sense. We got extraordinary stories from friends about very important things in their life and what had been going on inside them spiritually as, as these events and actions were unfolding. And a lot of the people who, who ended up speaking were, were, were folks I thought I knew pretty well. You know, I'd known for years, um, many of them outside meeting as well as inside meeting. And I learned new things about everybody. Um, and when I think, how do I testify? I think about these friends and how they're, how they speak about their lives, you know, things they did. Some, some, some friends had really pretty unusual experiences. Others talked about really quite normal life events, like deciding to change jobs. Um, because they had a connection to the divine that was leading them, that was guiding them, that was inspiring them, that they were trying to follow. And so I would like to close with another quote that we have seen before. Um, this is from the sermon that George Fox gave when Margaret Fell heard him speak for the first time. And Fox said, you will say, Christ saith this, and the apostles say this, but what canst thou say? Art thou a child of the light, and hast thou walked in the light? And what thou speakest, is it inwardly from God? And what I think this quotation from Fox does is actually two things. First of all, it puts the responsibility for testifying on each individual on us. You cannot rely on Christ. You cannot rely on the apostles. What canst thou say? And the second is the question, how do you know that you're right? Art thou a child of the light and hast thou walked in the light and what thou speakest, is it truly from God? And I think what Fox has done here is described leadings and clearness in the English of the 17th century when the Religious Society of Friends was a glimmer 
in his imagination at best, but I think it is a principle that has led us well 